you guys will all be very busy on this one, but regulation should be starting up fairly soon, I'm sure, after we get the staff for that bill. But that'll be a big one. Um, other items of note, SB 1335 is a bill that asks all state agencies to use recyclable packaging, food packaging, food service packaging, and as part of that, CalRecycle will need to maintain a list of the food package, packaging um, materials that are recyclable. And so again, that will require regulations and we'll be doing that over the next couple of years. Yeah, they're due in 2021. Um, SB 720 just uh, formalizes our environmental education program and directs that um, we incorporate climate change into the curriculum on that one. Um, I think of other ones. Uh, in the bottle bill program, AB 2493 extends the program a little bit to allow a little bit more flexibility for reverse vending machines and also allows a slightly um, change payment method to allow for those reverse vending machines. A number of bills did not pass. Again, I don't really want to highlight those too much unless there are, are questions. Uh, another one that did pass, or two that do, did pass that, that focus on compost or AB 1981 and AB 2411. Both of these asks CalRecycle to work with other state agencies in looking at how we can use compost either on uh, for roads for Caltrans or as part of debris removal. So we'll be working on those as well. That's pretty much it, unless there are questions. Do we have mics? Kathy Lynch, CRRC, Nick's such a gentleman. <laughs> I just had a question on the fire-related bills like SB 901 and others and what involvement you think CalRecycle might have in those efforts. I pass it on to 2411. The, the, are you talk, you're talking about bills that don't necessarily involve CalRecycle or debris removal, right? So, I mean, CalRecycle will be a part of those efforts, and I'm, I'm looking down at the team who works on fire a little bit more than I do, but, uh, you know, our role in fire is related to being tasked by the governor's office, so that is mostly related to debris removal. So um, if our, if we need to stand beyond that. I don't right. I don't have a, I didn't prepare for this question, but, um, <laughs> and I don't have a complete recollection, but I, I do recall that some of the, um, uh, bills were talking about use of um, compost and yes. mulch um, in fire damaged areas. Yes. And I believe Cal Recycle may have been mentioned as being available for consultation and, and Absolutely. That sort of thing, as, but no direct responsibility right. in, um, in some of those areas. Right, AB 1981 asks us to be, well, it's a part, they add Cal Fire to an existing task force that talks about compost use. So we are part of those conversations already and Cal Fire's input will be very helpful as those regulation, or sorry, those uh, discussions happen and we develop new policies for that. Then there's also the 2411, which again, tasks us to talk to both um, Caltrans and a bit with Cal Fire on how to use compost on fire damage lands. Thank you. I think that what we're looking at is sort of the market development side of this as we get into 1383 and others. There is a lot of research on the use of compost in fire scarred land. So we'd like to see you be more involved, even if you don't have direct responsibility as part of market development. Thank you. Right. And I think that that will come up as part of the discussion on those two bills. Uh, good morning. Nick Lapis, California Against Waste. My question was actually fairly similar to Kathy's. I was wondering if you guys have given any thought to the process for implementing 2411, 1981, if there's any thought of maybe having some initial workshops uh, in the fall, winter timeframe. Go ahead, Adam. It's on my list. Right now, uh, and 2411 does require us to come up with a plan regarding um, these issues, use of compost on fire recovery lands. We've been scrambling more to deal with 212 and gearing up for that. So um, it, is on, uh, it is on our list and uh, we'll be letting you know what we're gonna do on that. Great, thanks.
world. Evan Edgar, California Compost Coalition. I'm going to triple down on compost, uh, both um, 1981 and 2411. Um, 1981 actually adds fire to AB 1045. Yes. And we've been working on that for years, and that's been lagging behind. I'm glad there's a relook at 1045, especially quarterly meetings with annual meeting by um, annual update by Cal EPA. We've been asking that for every six months. Hopefully this will restart the process to get 1045 to some type of recommendations and annual report in order to actually support the compost use. On 2411, once again, that bill um, kind of implements a bill from 1991 with regards to compost use. Caltrans has been specking out compost since, 19, since 1991, and at this point they're only using about 40,000 tons per year, about 1% of the market. There's supposed to be an annual report that they have a um, bi-recycled and report, and they'd only report upon that. So it's great that we pass laws to implement laws, but uh, we're looking for implementation this year with this opportunity to help out fire ravage lands. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, All right. Thank you, Ms. McIntyre. Um, so also under director support this morning, I just want to take a minute and uh, recognize an employee who is going to be retiring uh, from Cal Recycle, uh, Mr. Tom Estes, who is currently our uh, a deputy on our executive team. Um, so, Tom, if you could just step down here for a minute and we can embarrass each other for a minute. Just a Better than a public flogging. Um, so, I uh, we've written something here for Tom. I'm not going to recite it in its entirety, but just to give you a flavor of um, how we feel. So. On behalf of the State of California and the Department of Resources Recycling and Recovery, I want to offer my deepest appreciation for your dedicated leadership and your valued contributions to our mission of greater sustainability, environmental protection, and health of our state's economy and its people. You began your service as a landfill inspector in Southern California, and you transferred to us, uh, Sacramento as a spokesperson in public affairs, which I'm still not sure how anyone allowed that to happen, but that's another story altogether. Um, you later took a leadership role in um, California's first sustainable building program. So he's a, uh, before his current role, he had a, a pretty uh, diverse background. Um, drawing from your previous private sector experience in business administration, you assumed an executive staff role as our deputy director in charge of administration, finance, and IT. Uh, this job included oversight of a $1.5 billion budget, which was not without its unique challenges, including the complex job of merging CalRecycle's two legacy uh, agencies in 2010. Your selfless service and decisively engaged leadership has left a lasting impression on this organization. For those concerned about how you will now fill your time in a satisfying manner, they needn't be. Anyone with a loving family, dear friends, an adventurous spirit that has taken him to locales around the world, a bevy of hobbies such as four-wheeling and photography, and a return to the childhood home in idyllic San Luis Obispo is a friend to be envied. When you took this job, uh, a job with this organization in 1987, you planned to stay for one year. Your decision to make a career with us has been of lasting benefit to the cause of recycling and the well-being of our state. We will miss you as a colleague and a friend and wish you the very best in retirement. So I just want to say, uh, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, you dwarf my presence here in this department, but I'm uh, I'm I'm here now, so I'm the guy that gets to to, to see you off. And I've appreciated working with you and your laser-like focus on maintaining the credibility of this department um, from the lens of the your chair as a deputy. You've been fantastic at that job, um, and you've provided. Uh, endless sort of humor and comic relief for all of us and good friendship. So thank you very much, thank you, Tom. Scott. Yeah. Very nice. Thank yeah. you. And uh, so the longer version of what we just wrote up uh, is uh, written in a letter for you here. Very so, nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to miss you. Thank you. Yeah. Not too far away. <laughs> uh, OK. Um, we're going to move on to uh, DRS. You want to come up? Thanks. Oh, so, do you need to look at the screen? Uh, probably. Okay, so apparently this is. I know. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Is that going to work for you? Yeah, that's fine. 
Hi everyone, good morning. I'm Kate Wilkins. I pre represent the Policy Development and Analysis Office. I'm here to present the status of quarterly disposal report submittals for the second quarter of 2018. So uh, counties can submit these reports online through the electronic disposal reporting system, better known as EDRS, or they can email them to the disposal report coordinator at our uh, DRS at calrecycle.ca.gov. Uh, DRS staff are available to assist county and facility staff to ensure complete and timely reports are being submitted. So uh, the quarterly due date for the second quarter was Monday, October 15th, yesterday, 5 p.m. Um, and as of, Good size. As of uh, as of yesterday, 5 p.m., the following nine counties did not submit their second quarter DRS reports by the due date. So that's Alpine, Calusa, Contra Costa, Del Norte, Kings, Marin, Modoc, Napa, and Nevada. Uh, Contra Costa, San Joaquin, and Merced counties did submit their reports, but it was after the 5 p.m. deadline. Um, we have been seeing an increasing trend in late submissions in the last few quarters. And counties must report through the EDRS system through the second quarter of next year. So transfer stations and mixed waste processing facilities are also required to submit quarterly station reports to the counties. And in quarter one of 2018, uh, only 58% of facilities submitted their QSNs. So more than a third have not submitted those quarter one uh, quarterly station notifications. We are hoping to see these numbers improve because these facilities will be required to report under AB 901, recycling and disposal reporting requirements, and uh, will face penalties for late reports or non-submittals. So the, the second quarter QSNs were due yesterday at 5 p.m. also. Um, there are still some counties who have only submitted a portion of their facilities, but we are working with these counties to obtain 100%. So the advantages of submitting reports online to the EDRS system makes the data available immediately for jurisdictions to review. And after review, jurisdictions can request revisions if necessary uh, in a timely manner. And this improves accuracy and standardizes the disposal data. So counties are encouraged to upload and enter their data into the EDRS every quarter. Um, Zoe will be talking more about AB 901 in the following quarter presentation, but briefly, 901 reporting will start in the third quarter of 2019, so please continue to report in DRS the same as you have in the past. This will continue through the second quarter of 2019. Um, and you can subscribe to the listserv to get most current and up-to-date information about AB 901. If you have comments, questions, concerns, please send them to the, the 901 mailbox that's on the slide. Yes, okay. Thanks for your time and patience. Any questions? Evan Edgar, Edgar Associates. Um, more data doesn't only make more recycling, but better data makes better policy. But the right data to get is kind of expensive sometimes. So both with AB 901 and 1383, we like to roll it out to make sure we got the right data to make the right knowledge integration. We look forward to that because we will want to know what's happening to all the wood chips if they're going to ADC, if all the green waste is going to land application. So there's a lot of good knowledge will come out of the better data for 901. So we look forward to the release in, in July 2019. And with uh, SB 498, when wood chips of biomass, we did some beta testing. And that data took a while to get the forms right. So we volunteer on behalf of the industry to help out with any beta testing that you may need to do with AB 901 because it may take a little while to get all that data in the right format to understand and how to collect that data without being too expensive to the industry, but getting you the right knowledge in order to make better policy. And we do need better policy uh, with regards to late reporting. I've been waiting forward to the Cal Recycle recycling rate for AB 341 for calendar year 2017. In 2016, Cal Recycle posted a statewide recycling rate of 44%. And looking at trends, it looked like we're gonna lose about uh, 2 million tons of disposal in 2017, so that recycling rate's gonna dip down to about 42% for 2017. And at this rate, I think we'd be below 40% by 2020. And the AB 341 report, of course, has a 75% goal by 2020. With a trend of going under 40% by 2020, I was hoping that Cal Recycle may use this knowledge integration to somehow look at that report again. 75% um, we're not gonna make it. We're gonna be at 40%. What can we do on a move forward basis to look at that report again, submit to the legislature, the China sword is killing us, but we have a great opportunity with SB 1383. 
So I guess my question is, when do you think the Kawasaki is going to post up um, the calendar rate 2017 and any forecasting be done uh, with regards to the 2020 recycling rate? Thanks for your comments, Evan. We're hoping to get the report out by the next public meeting. Um, so we'll have a presentation and we'll have the report. And in the report, we'll have some um, information that that addresses different issues that came out in the 341 report. And um, we can talk about that then, how that aligns. What we're seeing on mixed paper on the MRF recycling that all the residual rates going up because of the fact that mixed paper and the industry had a lot of technology. I'm out working with a lot of um, MRF operators by adding in all types of um, robotics to optical sorting to everything possible with a lot of money get down to 0.5%. Even with that, mixed paper, mixed plastics having a tough time to move it. And the trend analysis from your dis export report was 22 million in 2011 down to, I think it was 15 million in 2016 and dropping quickly. And the landfills are filling up quickly. So it'd be nice to see some forecasting. I know you have a nice workshop coming up on November 7th about the China sword, but any forecasting to 2020, because we're gonna be under 40% by 2020 and far away from 75%, and we gotta turn the ship around but I don't see how we're gonna do it. Yeah, we can take a look at that. And um, along with our state of report, we'll have our exports report coming out as well for this year. Thank you. So did I get that right, that only 58% of facilities reported on time? In quarter one, we haven't pulled the numbers for this quarter. because it was it, It's hard week. to interpret that as anything other than um, a lack of care on my part, uh, or on the part of the industry for timely submittal. Um, it's the, how long have these requirements been on the books? I don't know, decades? They're not new. Um, so I think, you know, I'd like to see an improvement there. I'd hate for us to, to roll out 901 and just start having, you know, just an immense amount of enforcement because folks aren't complying. Um, but that's where we, I mean, when we uh, renegotiated, um, what we were doing with uh, the recycling regulations and the recycling reporting regulations, you know, we, we sat down with industry and we talked about trying to find a middle road here on what would make sense for the state, what our actual needs were. Uh, we eliminated some authority that we thought we didn't really need to impose, you know, that wasn't really necessary for the state. Um, so we tried to strike a middle ground, but I'm, I'm nervous that I'm just still seeing this low level of compliance with basic reporting on the part of the industry. So. I, I hope that we'll see an improvement in that. So, thank you. Quick update on AB 901 and where we are in the process. The latest draft of the regulations is available on CalRecycle's website, and the current 15-day comment period closes tonight at midnight. As Kate said, the latest draft of the regulations proposes postponing the implementation of the recycling and disposal reporting system until the third quarter of 2019. It would keep the current disposal reporting system in place for another two quarters, so through quarter two of 2019. The department anticipates approving the regulations package in November, at which time the regulations will be sent to the Office of Administrative Law for final adoption and publication. Thank you. Any questions on that? Mr. Wollendekar. Okay, before I get started on the uh, carpet item, Tom, I just want to say congrats, and it's been a heck of a ride, and we'll roast you in other ways, so um, he's been amazing. Um, okay, now we're going to go on to um, the item on consideration of the uh, CARES Revised Car California Carpet Stewardship Plan for the years 2018 to 2022. I'm going to make some introductory remarks and ask Fareed Fahut to come up. And Fareed, you can kind of figure out the screen there with, with Scott. Um, I think, as you all know, we oversee the first uh, mandatory carpet stewardship program in the country. Uh, that's pursuant to AB 2398, which was passed in 2010. Um, today, we're considering whether CARES proposed revised I underline that, plan for 2018 to 2022 meets the statutory requirements for the program that were set forth in AB 2398 and that um, also uh, pursuant to AB 1158, uh, which was passed last year. 
uh, before we get going, I, I've done this in the past, I do still want to reiterate our uh, thanks to and appreciation to Bob Peoples, and uh, I know a number of the, his team are, are in here in the, um, in the audience for the efforts they've made over the years. I think I saw Rachel way in the back. There you are. Thanks, Rachel, uh, who's chair of the advisory committee and as members of the advisory committee here as well for all of your efforts to provide comments on various iterations of the plan. Uh, as, you, as you all know, we disapproved CARE's proposed plan a few months ago, and so this is a resubmittal of that. Uh, we had two primary findings on that that Fareed's going to talk about. We, we know a lot of you are concerned about what might happen if, um, uh, the, in terms of impacts on California collectors and recyclers if this plan is disapproved. Um, so that's uh, something that we're well aware of. We're also um, thinking about the future. And I just want to point out that uh, in the item, and, and Fried will briefly talk about this, we have included some ideas for potential statutory changes that would allow us uh, to address the situation where a plan is disapproved or if a plan is revoked or terminated, because we still have concerns about the long-term success here, and we uh, currently don't have the statutory authority to really deal with that kind of situation. So I just want to make uh, folks aware of that. Uh, at any rate, Fareed's going to describe uh, staff's conclusions that CARE has adequately addressed one of the two primary findings, um, but not, um, uh, not the one on economic analysis. And I want to interject my own personal thoughts here. I'm, I'm disappointed that we're in this kind of situation uh, after seven years of running the program and after three years of harping on the need for an economic analysis that uh, can justify the assessment level, we're still not there. And I have, I have my own personal thoughts on why that's the case. I'm not gonna uh, go into that. Uh, I think page, uh, there's a page six paragraph in the uh, agenda item that is pretty explicit about uh, how we view this, this issue. Um, I also am not going to provide you in my personal thoughts about the social media campaign that's been going on uh, in recent weeks. Um, I'll just refrain from, from saying more about that. Despite that, uh, I think it's true that CARE has made some progress on uh, some of the issues that we've um, described in the uh, agenda item a couple months ago, particularly on some of the aspects that are needed to conduct the, uh, the economic analysis. And that's the basis for some of the conditions that we're including in our recommendation today. So with that said, I'm going to turn to Fareed. He's going to explain uh, staff's analysis and then end up with the final uh, recommendation that we're making to the director. Thanks, Howard, for that introduction. Good morning. Uh, I would uh, I'd like to start by um, giving you a brief background on the program. Um, CARE began implementation of its uh, corporate stewardship program in uh, July of 2011. That's about seven years ago, and operated under several different uh, plans at that time. The statute initially specified a five cents per square yard assessment. Currently, that assessment is 25 cents per square yard. And in this plan, uh, CARE is proposing to increase it to 35 cents per square yard. Uh, the graph shows the uh, performance of the program from the start, that's uh, 2011, to the most recent data, which is uh, Q2 of 2018. As uh, you can see, it's the um, recycling rate is 16.3%. I don't know if this, you could see this, this is, uh, maybe it doesn't show on the, on the white the, the laser, but um, uh, anyway, care is uh, uh, required by statute to meet a recycling rate of 24% by January 1, 2020. CARE's uh, last approved plan ended in December of uh, December 31st, 2016. Uh, Director Smetlein um, allowed CARE to continue to operate under uh, the, that plan under conditions specified in CalRecycle's uh, enforcement plan. Under that enforcement plan, manufacturers could continue to sell their carpets in California. 
by participating in the CARES 2011-2016 plan. Um, CARES submitted a carpet stewardship plan to CalRecycle on March 16th of 2018, which was disapproved on May 15th of 2018 because it did not meet all the requirements of the law. Subsequent to disapproving CARES 2018-2022 plan, CalRecycle updated its enforcement plan so manufacturers could still continue to sell their carpets in California while uh, a uh, plan for submittal was being prepared. CalRecycle disapproved CARES plan on May 15th of this year, and both the reasons for disapproval and the requirement that must be met in the revised plan were specified in the May 15th request for approval, or the RFA. As described in the RFA, a revised plan would have to address a number of requirements related to grants, incentives, and uh, subsidies. Uh, in order to obtain plan approval. The requirements included a revised subsidy structure that incentivized recycling of carbon materials with the highest recyclability, a revised structure of the grant program that incentivized recycling of carbon materials with the highest recyclability, um, description describing a methodology that CARE used uh, to determine how uh, each product material or carpet type was ranked for recyclability, and then allocation of funds uh, for in, in, uh, in its budget uh, for incentive and uh, or grants to state-approved apprenticeship uh, program for training apprentice and journey-level carpet uh, installers in uh, proper carpet recycling practices. The second set of requirements that needed to be addressed in a revised plan uh, related to the funding mechanism for the plan specifically, uh, CARE needed to uh, provide CalRecycle a complete description of its economic analysis that one, estimated the cost of achieving a recycling rate of 24% by January 1, 2020, and 26% by December 31st, 2022, and show that that analysis uh, supported the assessment of 35 cents per square yard, and also include uh, uh, maintain a, an appropriate reserve fund uh, balances. Uh, staff considers CARES revision to the plan to address requirements related to grant subsidy and incentive uh, sufficient for plan approval. The second set of uh, requirements that CARE needed to address in a revised plan related to funding mechanism and the associated uh, economic analysis to support it. CARE's revised plan included selective examples and descriptions of a number of its models. Uh, uh, it was the subsidy justification model, um, financial model, economic, and uh, conversion cost models. But um, CARE did not provide a full description of its analysis to justify the 35 cents per square yard uh, assessment. Uh, CARE's revised plan acknowledged that the operating cost for collector sorters is unknown and proposed to survey collector sorters to better understand the average operating cost for collector sorters providing backup uh, pickup services uh, for retailers. CARE committed in its revised plan to complete a collection convenience study, which includes both the cost uh, uh, to private collection network and uh, uh, public collection sites. The 
The legislatively established advisory committee reviewed the plan and expressed concern with the plan, for example, uh, with differential assessment uh, or with, and determination of highest recyclability. However, in the interest of stability of the recycling infrastructure, it recommended approval of the plan. We also received uh, eight other comments from other stakeholders. There were two comments from uh, uh, environmental advocacy groups. Uh, they uh, recommended disapproval, citing uh, uh, um, insufficient focus on recyclability, lack of transparency, and failure to meet statutory requirement of uh, collection convenience. Um, two comments letters were from industry association, uh, one from uh, uh, carpet recyclers, and two were from manufacturers of uh, products made from post-consumer carpet. All of these five commenters uh, recommended approval of the plan, uh, indicating that in the absence of an alternative plan, uh, there will be uh, 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 uncertainty and disruption uh, for the recycling community and therefore they uh, uh, recommended approval. And we also received one letter that did not uh, comment whether to approve or disapprove the plan. Uh, options uh, for the director, uh, option one is the disapprove the plan. Uh, option two is conditionally approve the plan pending submittal of uh, a revised plan that adequately addresses the items outlined in the request for approval. And uh, the third option is uh, approve the plan. Uh, staff is recommending option two. The staff concluded that um, CARE's revised plan did not meet the requirements for approval of the plan as articulated in the May 15th RFA. Fundamentally, uh, CARE's revised plan did not include a complete economic analysis and did not provide an adequate justification demonstrating that the overall funding uh, will be adequate to achieve the goal of 24% uh, recycling rate by January 1, 2020 and 26% uh, by December 31st, 2022. However, CARE has made uh, enough progress towards meeting the requirements of the RFA to enable staff to recommend conditional approval of the plan. Next, I'll walk you through the conditions that CARE must meet to obtain approval of the plan. Uh, CARE must commit to conduct and provide CalRecycle an independent, detailed economic analysis. Update the subsidy uh, justification and conversion cost models and demonstrate that it's using California specific data in its models and account for regional cost differences. Um, modify its uh, convenience goals, uh, which should be consistent with the uh, results of the convenience study and establish a minimum weight of post-consumer recycled carpet content that the product must contain on an annual basis uh, um, to be considered as a product made from post-consumer carpet and uh, develop agreed upon procedures for um, uh, carpet reuse. Um, CARE must fulfill all these commitment by September 1, 2019. The plan must incorporate required changes, uh, including changes recommended in the attachment five of the RFA. CARE can put all of the changes into a new separate chapter or a section at the beginning of the plan. This must be done within 60 days, that is uh, December 15, uh, 2018. The plan needs to include statements and be clear that the new chapter supersedes anything that conflicts with, within the body of the document. 
CalRecycle is not asking uh, care that the changes be made in the body of the plan by December 15th. Those can be incorporated over time. Uh, per statute, uh, care must submit to the advisory committee within 30 days, that's November 15, uh, the draft new chapter. The AC would uh, review and comment uh, it, and will limit those review and comment to the new chapter, not the whole plan. Once Cal Recycle receives the uh, plan on December 15th, Cal Recycle will have 60 days to review and um, the changes and will make recommendation via an RFA uh, either in January or February of uh, 2019. And uh, it's again, I like to emphasize that CARE must fulfill its commitment by September 1, 2019. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. And I'll turn it back to Howard. Thanks, Fareed. Uh, I appreciate uh, that you made a very complex subject understandable and, and relatively succinct. It is complicated, and our recommendation is complicated, so I want to reiterate a couple of things. Uh, one is, again, we are recommending conditional approval, which if the director uh, does agree with that, that means that things can go forward under this under this plan. But we are expecting a number of things to happen. There, there are some things that need to be completed uh, within the next 60 days, and they need to be described and included in what is submitted in the next 60 days. And those are listed on in the first big bullet on, on page two. Um, there are other things that CARE is planning to do, such as convenience study and continued work on the economic analysis. And what we're basically saying is we want to see a commitment in writing in that new chapter in the plan that commits to completing those by September 1st, 2019. They're obviously not going to be done in 60 days, but we want a commitment. And that chapter will become a part of this plan and it will be enforceable. So that's the rationale behind having those things in writing, uh, both the completed things that it will be done in 60 days and the commitments to do other things uh, by September 1, 2019. I know that um, staff has a, a meeting with CARE after this uh, item to talk through some of those logistics, assuming the director does uh, approve this, that recommendation. So there's more details on that in terms of how to work that out. But one thing we didn't want to do was, uh, this is a, the, the carpet plan, I have 400 pages or something like that. There are a lot of things that would um, have to be changed line by line. We're not expecting the line by line editing by um, in the next 60 days. That's why we're uh, saying put together a chapter that on its own, a standalone chapter that says, we're, here's the completed results of, of the conditions on the first bullet in page two, and here are our commitments to the other things related to convenience study, um, uh, AUPs, uh, the, the uh, economic analysis, things like that. So uh, hopefully that's a little become clearer to CARE uh, and the, the CARE team after you, you talk to our, our folks. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Now I want to open it up to um, stakeholder comments. I'll offer Bob, usually you prefer to go last. Is that the case today? Okay. Um, so I'd like to open it up to uh, any stakeholder comments. And we've got a couple of mics in the back. So if, uh, if you all could just identify your name and affiliation, um, since we're on the uh, webcast, appreciate it. Yeah, my name is Franco Rossi. I'm with Aquafil, and we're a fiber manufacturer and uh, a carpet recycler, which are now heavily invested uh, in the West Coast, and in particular in California. I just want to say that I support the findings of uh, staff, and I fully appreciate your analysis and your conclusions. I appreciate in particular your reference to the fact that um, the law might need some improvement or some changes so to be perfected, and especially with reference to two points, as you mentioned. One is the fact that uh, in case of revocation or for any reason a current plan should be discontinued, but need to be in a bridge, that's the word that you used, in order to allow the system to continue to function even in absence of a fully approved plan. That's a very important point to us and 
for the, in general, from the infrastructure, which is still fragile of the carpet recycling in California. The second point that I wanted to underline is that um, there's also a mention of uh, differential assessment in the necessities or the suggestion for future improvement of the legislations. And uh, what I wanted to say, uh, as Aquafil, we believe that modestly we are expert in nylon six recycling, carpet recycling and nylon six recycling more in general. And uh, whenever a differential assessment will be implemented, we believe that the current level of subsidy of nylon six could be reduced. And once that become coherent and correlated to the amount of assessment. Um, in a normalized environment, uh, nylon six is a very recyclable material. It does not really require 25 cents a pound of uh, subsidy to be functional and, and marketable. Thank you. Thanks, Franco. And uh, we look forward to seeing your facility coming online and it would be nice to see. Other comments or questions? Wow, very quiet. Oh, Kelly. Okay. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Philip Ivey. Um, I'm with Millican. Uh, we're a floor covering manufacturer. Um, <clears throat> I have the pleasure of being the chairman of the SBC for CARE and uh, just wanted to comment that, you know, personally have spent hundreds of hours on the plan as, as you see is uh, quite uh, a book. And uh, just want to say that on behalf of Millican and Company, uh, we support uh, the whole approval of the plan, uh, not a conditional approval. Um, we feel confident that we meet the intent of the statute for 22, uh, AB 2398 and 1158. And, uh, you know, we also want to make sure that, um, you know, the plan moves forward so that it does not disrupt the recycling industry in California. Uh, that has been built over the last eight plus years so that the plan's been in place. And uh, we think that what we've got there is a very good plan that's very doable and that we provided the intent necessary to meet the requirements of the law. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. If I could just ask a clarifying question of you. Is it your belief that the charge of this department is to approve or disapprove the plan based on the intent of the statute? Uh, it's my belief that that we that the intent is that we have the plan has to meet the law. I'm not sure that answers your question. It does not. You said that you think the plan meets the intent of the statute. That's correct. Clear. Okay. My question was, is it your belief that the charge of this department is to approve or disapprove based on meeting the intent of the statute, as opposed to I'll be more clear, the letter of the statute? Uh, I, I wouldn't propose that I'm a professional. Uh, uh, that I have the knowledge to Fair answer enough. that question. And I, I don't mean to pin you down. I just ask because it's our belief and our understanding, just for clarification, that our charge is to approve or disapprove a plan based on the letter of the law. So just. And, and could you just explain the difference for me, the letter of the law versus the intent? Yeah, there are a number of sections that have specific requirements in the statute. Um, and so we read those and then we lay the plan next to it and we go through item by item, section by section of the statute to see if the plan as presented to us meets the requirement, the plain reading, if you will, of the requirement of the statute. Um, it's not our belief that we have the flexibility to say, well, generally this plan meets the intent of what the legislature wanted, even though there's sections of it that don't meet the specific requirements. So that would be in my mind the difference. Gotcha. There certainly are some parts of the law that have an interpretation, though, right? Well, all of it. Uh, like most recyclable product? Uh, I'd say you, you could argue that all of it's open to interpretation on some level, sure. Right. Thank but you. that's also our job. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Kelly McBee with the Environmental Group, Californians Against Waste. 
Um, I wanted to say that Californians Against Waste agrees with CalRecycle that the plan is not ready for complete approval at this time. Most importantly to us is the independent economic analysis validating the assessment rate. For me, that will include an evaluation that subsidies in the plan subsidize carpet with the highest recyclability. This has been a sticking point on the advisory committee and I was actually one of the dissenting votes, if you will, um, with the advisory committee's most recent meeting, um, saying that because that is not included at this point, the plan cannot be approved. I think subsidizing carpets with the highest recyclability is one of the strongest components of the most recent carpet law, AB 1158, and I really look forward to seeing um, how CARE is able to incorporate that in the next submitted plan. Um, Additionally, I wanted to compliment CalRecycle on the compilation of the statutory recommendations. I think that's really important moving forward um, to ensure that we have kind of a stopgap uh, backstop in the event that another plan is disapproved. Um, I, my favorite of those recommendations is definitely the uh, requirement for differential assessments. I think that's critical. That's been another point that I have repeated um, in every advisory committee meeting that we've had that in order to incentivize green design of carpet in order to potentially shift markets into carpets that are the most recyclable, we need to have a differential assessment. And so uh, Californians Against Waste would be supportive of the legislature uh, moving forward with that recommendation, um, as well as the remaining ones that CalRecycle made. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Heidi? Thanks. Uh, I'm Heidi Sanborn with the National Stewardship Action Council and I can support everything Kelly said. Um, and I want to thank CalRecycle. You guys did a great job on the staff report and the analysis. Um, as you know, we sponsored AB 1158 last year, which created the advisory committee. And I also want to thank them because there was an awful lot of work and a lot of time put in. And there's, these are very difficult decisions. And I think they deserve a lot of credit for the amount of time they put in to try and make this program work. Um, Today feels like Groundhog Day. We've been here over and over and over and over again. Um, CARE has failed again to provide what has been asked for for years on this economic model. To date, we still have 28% of the counties that have no collection after this bill passed originally in 2010. Our recycling rate has only increased 1% a year from the date the bill passed till now. We're gone from 8% to 16%. Um, and they've submitted an inadequate plan again, which puts instability in the carpet recycling system, puts cow recycle in a hard spot, and really we believe the only options are disapproval or conditional approval at best. The good news though is that we still have the highest recycling rate of carpet in the, in the country, so it's better than nothing. And um, Aquafell has cited in Woodland and is in the press and they've made a large investment and we're extremely grateful for that because at a time when we're losing markets and we're not meeting our recycling rates, we need to give the businesses support that have made large investments in California's infrastructure. So if Director Smithline accepts the staff recommendation, we see it as CARE's very, very last chance to get it right. We agree with the statutory changes but want people to know too that we actually tried to get a transition plan in AB 1158 and we're told that that would trigger a two-thirds vote, and we do not want to risk losing the bill, which provided urgent fixes, including ensuring the CARE did not use our public fee money to pay fines, which we knew CalRecycle was levying. Also, that we wanted to ban the use of the fee money for incinerating carpet and set a hard recycling goal of 24% by 2020, which originally CARE said they could make, and then they said that they could not. So we would look to try and find a way to change the law that would not trigger a two-thirds vote. That would be extremely difficult, but doable if we must. So we are sorry that CARES once again put CalRecycle, the advisory committee, and all Californians in this position. No matter what decision is made, we will continue to watch this program and do what needs to be done until it works as envisioned by the legislature. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. Jerry, behind you. 
Uh, Mr. Smith Line, officers of Cal Recycle. Uh, my name is David Bender. I'm the chief executive officer of Circular Polymers. Circular Polymers is the second largest reclaimer or processor as uh, you refer to it in California. We're just up the street in Lincoln, California. Um, <clears throat> I have a little different take and mine is your process worked. This is Groundhog Day. Heidi's absolutely right about that, but your process worked. This is not the same plan that was submitted a year ago. It's significantly improved and we can live with this plan. Um, sure, there might be some issues, but the fact of the matter is, is that this plan works for processors in the state of California. This plan enables us to move the ball forward. So we would recommend approval of this plan. Um, it's not perfect, but again, because of all of the work that Fareed and the rest of Cal Recycle and the team did, it's got us to a point where, again, we can accept this plan, not to mention the work of the advisory council. So um, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, David. Eric, you're up next. Thanks. Good morning, Eric Nelson. I wrote a few things down so that I didn't forget anything. I've been working to promote carpet recycling uh, in California and across the country for 13 years. I work for Interface. Interface is a leader in carpet manufacturing, also known globally for our sustainable business practices. As a part of my duties for Interface, I also serve on the Care Board of Directors, the Care Stewardship Planning Committee, and the California Carpet Advisory Council. I also work with many collectors and recyclers across the country. In the spring of 2011, I actually helped write the original stewardship plan after AB 2398 was passed. I am personally invested in this program and I desperately want it to succeed. Over the years, I've been to many public meetings, but never once have I chosen to make a comment until now. Today seems a little bit different. Today, I represent Interface in recommending disapproval of the latest plan submitted by CARE. I have worked faithfully with my colleagues, the CARE SPC, to create the best plan possible. And while we've made improvements, the plan fails several key pieces of the legislative intent. Most importantly, although not in statute and has been mentioned here several times already this morning, the CARE plan fails to adopt differential assessments. It only promises to take a look at it. In fact, as practiced, the CARE plan penalizes products that are more easily recycled. Nylon carpet, which is more recyclable, and requires much lower incentives to move in the marketplace actually subsidizes polyester carpet. This practice takes the industry in the wrong direction. According to industry trade publication Floor Covering News, polyester share of the residential market 10 years ago was 25% compared to nylon at 60%. Today, polyester and its cousin Triexta Together make up a whopping 66% of the residential market. Nylon, it's down to 25%. And because PET carpets are typically replaced more frequently, this effect is exacerbated in the collections market. We appreciate the view that some stakeholders have in urging a conditional approval, including short-term market pressures, lack of a defined transition plan, and the uncertainty of continued subsidy payouts. Despite this, we urge the state to focus on the longer term goal of an appropriate and workable plan that will give this program new life. Director Smithline, if this plan is approved, we will pledge, I will pledge, to continue to work with CARE in whatever way possible to achieve its goals and make the program successful for the citizens of California. However, as we have publicly stated, if the plan is not approved, Interface is committed to swiftly form a team of stakeholders to produce a new plan that takes the best parts of CARE's work and add in those critical ideas that will transform it into what we view is the best plan possible. 
and we pledge to create a governance structure that delivers on the legislative intent while meeting the needs of the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I, I appreciate that, and I know that that was a um, difficult position to be put in and, and to make those statements, so we're much appreciated. Yes, sir. Yes, good day. My name is Jay Hagan. I am here representing Mohawk Industries. Mohawk is the world's largest floor covering manufacturing leading producer of carpet sold in California. We are here to provide our full support to the CARE Carpet Stewardship Plan for 2018 through 2022. Mohawk has a long history and proud uh, history as a sustainable industry leader. We fully support and have participated in the long-term efforts of the carpet industry to find ways to divert from landfills and recycle post-consumer material. For example, Mohawk is the world's largest user of PET bottles, diverting over 3 billion pounds of bottles from landfills, which we use to make carpet with 100% recycled content. We have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in new manufacturing processes to create high quality carpet from PET bottles. We have also introduced our new Aero Unified Soft Flooring product, which is made of 100% PET, including recycled content, and is fully recyclable back into carpet and other products. Mohawk is committed to furthering our work with CARE and CalRecycle to make carpet recycling in California a continuing success. We are fully engaged with involvement and support of the carpet recycling statute and the stewardship plan. We directly support the mission of CARE and serve on the CARE Board of Directors. We proudly support CARE's newly submitted stewardship plan, which builds on our industry's commitment to finding the best solutions for our products at the end of their useful life cycles. This plan also reflects the lessons learned as we continue to address the significant challenges of a relatively new carpet recycling industry and a dynamic and sifting market which has dramatically affected the cost of diversion and recycling in California and elsewhere. Mohawk strongly believes that the plan is in full compliance with a carpet recycling statute. It is fully funded per, state, per statute and addresses the concerns of the advisory committee. The advisory committee joins the industry in recommending approval of the plan. The plan is designed to meet and exceed the targeted goals, including the recycling goal of 24% by January 1st, 2020. Despite headwinds such as lower oil prices and the China National Sword Program, CARE has been able to drive increasing recycling rates while other stewardship programs in the state have been declining and the state's overall recycling rates decline year over year. For the last three years, CARE has recorded a steady increase in the recycling rate despite major challenges in the marketplace. We know that failure to approve the plan will result in major turmoil and disruption in the carpet recycling community, and this uncertainty will likely cause a cancellation of current recycle expansion plans, a decline in recycling rates, and a significant step backward in the overall carpet recycling market. Mohawk looks forward to our continued work with Cal Recycle and CARE to fulfill the commitments and intentions of AB 2398. We give our strongest support to the proposed CARE stewardship plan for 2018 through 2022 and anticipate its approval by Cal Recycle. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments besides, yeah, there's one in the back, Gail. Hi, Gail Bryce with XT Green. Uh, we are building, <laughs> slow but sure, a uh, advanced manufacturing facility to uh, process post-consumer carpet. And uh, this thing's echoing. And I uh, just want to make it cl uh, clear, um, I'm also, I was one of the two uh, processors that made the comments, is that we said uh, we're supporting the advisory committee, which I'm a member of, uh, that earlier this year we said we wanted a conditional approval and we said that there was problems with the plan and we wanted some changes. And now our new approval is, we're saying, yeah, approve the plan, but there continu continues to be problems and they should be continued to be worked. So I didn't want anybody thinking that I, you know, thought it should be a unilateral uh, approval of the plan. I do not believe that. I think there's some, some issues. Um, I would like to uh, also support 
So just make it clear, I'm supporting the conditional approval of the plan and we're in the process of, you know, we've got about 10, $12 million into this now and our advanced manufacturing facility has been approved by the state as an advanced manufacturing facility because of high yields and protection of the worker and the environment and having very high greenhouse gas benefits from our new facility, which we're now looking at second quarter uh, next year to being done. Um, would like to just bring up, uh, I think there needs to be some statutory changes and we need to be very careful when it comes to things like uh, Franco had mentioned about increasing the surcharge on nylon, that that should be linked with uh, requirements when it comes to the technology high yields, protection of the environment, because there can be very easily have unintended consequences uh, that people that back in the old day just shearing carpet or doing it at a very low tech method and because it's a big come and get our nylon carpet and not have the yield. So I would say when it comes to statutory changes or some uh, requests and any plan changes, be very, very careful because if we get, uh, we can have a lot of people trying to grab that carpet rather than having the high yields. So just in summary, uh, I request that we have, a, I support the conditional approval uh, option. Thanks, Gail. Anyone else before Bob? Rachel, did you want to? Okay. Uh, good morning, Rachel Palapoli. I'm chair to the Carpet Advisory Committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak as well to Cal Recycle staff. Thank you for all of the time and dedication that you've put to this, as well as all the help that you've provided to this newly formed advisory committee. Uh, the committee was appointed less than 10 months ago, and it has been quite a busy 10 months. Our committee is of 16 have met in person five times for full day meetings traveling from all over the US, held four very long conference calls and have sent way too many emails. Um, we serve on this committee without compensation. All of our time is volunteered, dedicated to the duties outlined in AB 1158. We have done our best to meet tight timelines due to the deadlines, and we are all now quite versed on the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. I wanted to public recognize and thank the committee members for their dedication and hard work during the last 10 months. Director Smithline, I also wanted to personally let you know that we will support whatever decision that you make. If after your decision you have anything you'd like this committee to consider, to please let us know. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Doug? Good morning. Uh, Doug Kobold, Executive Director of California Product Stewards Council. Um, I wanted to echo uh, the thanks to Cal Recycle staff. They've spent a lot of time on this. Um, as a former uh, advisory committee member and carpet council member, I understand the length of time, effort that's gone into this to try and make this program work. Um, I'm disappointed with how far we've gotten. Um, I think that this program could be a lot better than it is. Um, I wanted to clarify something earlier by our Shah, the Shah representative who commented that the advisory committee uh, recommended approval. I'm gonna read specifically from the motion. The committee has remained, has remaining concerns with the plan. For example, differential assessments and determination of highest recyclability. But the committee also has concerns with the ramifications of the uncertainty with financial supports. The committee recommends that Cal Recycle approve the plan as submitted to support the stability of the recycling infrastructure and attainment of the 24% goal by 20 of January 1, 2020. The, the above is in recognition of ongoing input by the advisory committee and the plan uh, with the plan and the annual report. That was the actual motion that was brought forward and the re recommendation brought forward by the advisory committee. Um, I wanna thank uh, Joanne Brash, who is our staff member as a representative of the committee nowadays, who also voted with uh, Kelly McBee from California's Against Waste against this motion because we believe that it did not go far enough. Um, while we understand that there is a lot of stress on the recycling infrastructure, uh, whether it be from the China sword, uh, issues that are going on or with the carpet recycling itself, um, we need to go a lot farther here than we've, we've been. So um, I also wanna echo what Rachel just said that uh, 
Director Smith line, you have California Product Stewardship Council's full support with that whatever recommendation or whatever recommendation you choose to make or um, approval you may choose to make, and we'll be there to assist you wherever we can. Thanks, Doug. Hands keep popping up. Ron. I'm Ron Greitzer, Los Angeles Fiber Reliance Carpet Cushion. Uh, well, let me start off by saying um, thank you, staff. Thank you, the officers of Cal Recycle. Thank you, Director Smithline, for giving us a chance. Keep on giving us chances of trying to get it right. Um, we support the families of the employees I have support the recommendation of Cal Recycle to give us a, a, another chance to get it right and, and with the conditional approval. Um, we've put a lot of hours, speaking of um, with my care hat on, put a lot of hours to try to get it right. And we were, ne we were never trained on how to do this. We were just a bodies of um, em employees of companies or owners of companies trying to put together a plan without any pre-existing concept of how to do it right. And I think we've come a long way from where we started to where we are today. I also like to, I heard a lot of great comments. David's, yours were great. Um, Rachel has yours. Heidi, thank you for seven years ago, eight years ago, believing in what we could do. But this is important. Being a carpet recycler is not easy. You know, we've seen a lot of people in this room go up and down. Um, but I think we could do it with the support of Cal Recycle. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Okay, uh, not seeing any other hands, I'll ask um, Bob Peoples. Thank you, Howard. Um, and thanks to everybody that are here today that invests their time and energy in making comments and contributing to this challenge as we go forward. I wanna start by saying, or echoing, I guess, to the staff at Cal Recycle, Howard, your team, Scott, all of your folks, I fully appreciate how much time, energy, and effort, pain and suffering has gone into everything that you've done to get us to this meeting today because we've done the same thing on the opposite side of the table. So, so I fully appreciate that. The, um, the hard work, I, I wanna acknowledge the hard work of the care team here in California, some of my team members back in the West East Coast and also the members of the SPC who have met many, many, many times in person and by web calls at all hours of the day and night given East Coast, West Coast to try to come up with answers to this thing. Um, especially the recent efforts in, in crafting what will be responses to the RFA that went into the plan we submitted and, and the responses to the RFA that came out of this latest round. I, I believe it's been stated that CARE has made some very good progress in 2018, and, and that's despite um, some significant new developments, one of which I shared with Cal Recycle in the last week or so, and that is the suspension of operations of one of our key recyclers going forward for 2018 and 19. Um, it, has, it will probably have a major impact on output and uh, we're, we're working very hard now to creatively figure out how to respond to that impact. We're hoping it's transitory because I use the word suspended, not shut down. We're hoping that they'll come back online in the second quarter of 2019 because they're a significant outlet material. So we're actively working creatively to figure out how to respond to that. And that this development is barely two weeks old at this point in time. I, I want you to know that CARE and the SPC are fully committed to meeting all the requirements of the statute. And I personally really do look forward to continuing the chance to work with the talented Cal Recycle staff and the CARE team in 2019 and to continue on that upward trajectory that we do have going on. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Bob, and Fareed, thanks for standing through all that. Should have told you you could sit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so we've heard a lot of testimony. Um, some folks saying approve the plan, some folks, uh, one in particular saying disapprove the plan, 
a, a number uh, saying conditionally approved. Uh, as staff, you know, we obviously have concerns about the plan that has been put forth before us, and that's why there is a, lo a long list of conditions on page two that we are proposing have to be met in order for this plan to finally be approved uh, in the future. Um, I, I misspoke a little earlier. There's four bullets that talk about specific things where CARE needs to make commitments uh, in writing and explain how they're going to meet those commitments with a final date of September 1, 2019. And that has to be in this, uh, what we're proposing is a new chapter, so there's a standalone part of the plan. Uh, that's important because those are then enforceable provisions within the plan. Uh, we've worked, there is a large team here that is, as Bob said, spent a lot of hours on this, and it's, uh, there's a marvelous team. It's composed of folks from my uh, shop and from Mark DeBee's shop, Mark to the left. We have, uh, they're all, my team sitting in the front. We have the legal office. Kirby and, and George Ann and Trevor from Mark's shop and Cynthia and uh, Allie and Fareed and Clark from Brenda's shop. They've all done a great job. But it comes down to we need to have a plan that has very specific things that have to be met. And either it's they're met, uh, they're included in the 60 day, in the version that we're going to get in 60 days, and uh, we can move forward. But even then, there are commitments in that 60 day version that if they're not met by September 1, 2019, then we can take uh, further consideration of whether to disapprove or revoke or terminate the plan at that point in time. So uh, we're not done. Um, uh, you know, I wish we had alternatives. Uh, I wish we could require differential assessments. That's not something that we're able to require. Um, and those are things that we've asked CARE to consider in the past. Um, so there are a lot of things in that. And I'm, I know Bob and the team have been taking notes, but. Um, we, we have really spent a lot of time trying to detail out what we think is going to be needed to make this uh, an approvable plan, and, and it's up to you guys to make it that way. So, Scott, you've heard our recommendation. Uh, there's a lot of testimony, and um, we're prepared to do whatever you uh, ultimately decide. Okay. Thank you, Howard. Um, you know, this is a really important issue. It's important enough for me to spend hours reading through 250 pages that are not that are in advance of the appendix in that document, 250 plus pages. It's important enough for us to spend a considerable amount of executive time discussing to have all the staff that Howard just uh, referenced really devoting a significant amount of time to uh, working on this issue. It's important because it is uh, a significant EPR program and we all want it to be successful. I wish I could sit here and tell you that I have confidence that the CARE team is as committed, I wish I could tell you that I'm not feeling that today. Um, and just a number of weeks ago, the sense I got from the staff that we've been discussing that are doing all this hard work was that they were gonna recommend that I disapprove this plan. And I was prepared to disapprove this plan, but at the last minute, it seems like additional efforts were made to make commitments, to do additional work, um, and to get serious about the requirements of the statute that we are obligated to require be met. Um, and that's significant. And I do also want to, I want to acknowledge that progress, even if it felt begrudging and late, it happened. I want to acknowledge the progress that the industry has made. Um, we do see some improvement in the recycling rate. Um, I spent this uh, round also a significant time meeting with processors uh, in the state of California. And I would say they were divided, Mr. Peoples, on whether or not this plan would meet the rates. And that's informative to me. That's informative to me. They were divided. But they didn't all say no. Some of them said we think it can work. And that was, that was informative to me. Um, <clears throat> I don't approve or disapprove a plan based on my confidence in the stewardship organizations to implement the plan. Um, so. Well, that's not on the table for, for consideration. What is on the table is a list of specific items that have been laid out by staff that are required to be met in a 60-day time frame and then again in a 12-month time frame. Um, so under those circumstances, I'm prepared to approve the staff recommendation. But I want to be really clear that these conditional approvals will only take us so far. There have been uh, numerous times Together as a group, we have identified shortcomings in this statute. 
and the consequences of a disapproval are really still unaddressed, as far as I'm concerned, from a statewide perspective. Um, and since the passage of 1158, we have new tools, which include the path to revocation in addition to enforcement. Let's be clear, the state of California has accused CARE of failing to meet the obligations of its plan every year that we have done a review. So that needs to change. We need to, to figure that out because the next time may not be enforcement against care with penalties, it may be a revocation process because that's now on the table for us. So um, I'm not gonna spend any more time with admonishments, we've been here before. Uh, I do wanna close by saying I was hopeful after conversations with a number of the processors that this plan may actually work. So if you guys focus your efforts, maybe we will have a successful plan here and I am prepared to embrace that um, if you all do the work. So let's get it done. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Now, I, I know that uh, there's a meeting scheduled uh, between the care team and staff to go over some of these findings. So if you guys need to uh, leave, it's, it's A-OK. -okay. We're done with this item. Thank you all. I'll just give you a chance to get up before I move on. You want to? I've, I've got a few to run through. So we have a few workshops to announce. Howard and I will um, run through them. The first one is um, going to be on November 7th from 1 to 5, and the location's missing from the agenda. It'll be here in this room. And it's to discuss the local impacts caused by shifting markets um, resulting from national sort and other international import policies. We'll discuss AB 939 compliance, including a review of the countywide integrated waste management plan enforcement policy. Uh, we have a couple other workshops in November as well. Um, the first is on, uh, or the second after the, the one that Zoe just talked about is on November 13th. Uh, in the morning, it'll be revising the five-year tire plan. This is our uh, every other year process where we look at uh, projected uh, activities for the five-year tire plan, which encompasses all the different tire-related activities in, uh, at Calvary Cycle. So that's coming up. The day after that, on uh, November 14th, uh, in the afternoon, we will have a workshop to discuss uh, a possible pilot reuse grant program under the um, Climate Change Investments Program. This is the cap and trade dollars, and the director asked us to look at the possibility of having a grant program for reuse projects. So this will be the first um, public discussion of that. And uh, in between there, I forgot to, these weren't in order, um, coming up, uh, after the, the day after the National Sword Workshop, we will have uh, a workshop on the threats posed by uh, lithium batteries and the fires that have been occurring in MRFs and other places that will be led by uh, Teresa Bowie here in the front. So that's in the afternoon as well on November 8th. So we have a lot of workshops coming up pre-Thanksgiving. Okay, I, will, I guess I will keep going. I have a number of local assistance and grant items uh, before we get to solid waste and um, Department of Re Division of Recycling um, presentation. So we'll try to, to go through these. These are pretty quick except for one. Um, the first item is just a five-year review report for the countywide integrated waste management plan for Alameda County. That's something that we have to uh, have in a public meeting and that's been approved by CARA. Uh, thanks to Julia Dolloff, I don't see her here, but she for prep prepping that. 
The second item is a little more uh, meaty, and this is concerning the process for, under AB 20, 1826, we are gonna have to make some decisions in about two years about uh, who, what generators are going to be required to meet uh, the AB 1826 requirements. And there are a number of decision points in that. And while it's a ways off, um, it's something that we wanna lay out to, st to stakeholders as to how we're gonna approach that decision so they know now what to, what to uh, be planning for, at least be thinking about. Up to now, the triggers, uh, the ratchets of who's, uh, what generators are included have been automatic, they've been in statute. Now we're at a point where it's a discretionary decision with some different factors that we have to consider. So Kara's gonna go ahead and outline that process for us. Thank you, Howard. So as Howard uh, mentioned, AB 1826 established new requirements for mandatory commercial organics recycling. And in that legislation, it created a series of downward ratcheting generation thresholds for these generators that are subject to the law. In 2019, that threshold drops down again to four cubic yards of solid waste per week. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, these uh, changes in thresholds were uh, automatic in the law. Additionally, the law contains a 2020 trigger that will increase the number of affected businesses if waste reduction targets are not met. And that's the subject of our informational item today. This is not an automatic trigger like the other threshold uh, uh, triggers are. Uh, today, we'd like to share our plan process regarding implementation of AB 1826 provisions requiring CalRecycle to decide two things. One, uh, if CalRecycle <clears throat> to decide whether to require businesses that generate two or more cubic yards of solid waste per week to arrange for recycling services starting on or after January 1, 2020. And second, whether to extend the rural exemption from these requirements. As Howard noted, while we don't have to make this determination immediately, we felt it was important to inform stakeholders about our, our plan process. And we also wanted to give stakeholders an opportunity to um, ask any questions or share any input that they might have. So this is what we're planning on doing um, in early 2020. First, uh, CalRecycle staff will determine if statewide disposal of organic waste has not been reduced to the 50% level of 2014. I do want to point out that this AB 1826 trigger is based on whether there is a 50% reduction in AB 1826 organics from the 2014 level. Um, reminding everyone that the AB 1826 organics include food waste, green waste, landscape and pruning waste, non-hazardous wood waste, and food soiled paper waste that's mixed with food waste. This definition of organics is narrower than the definition proposed in the pending rulemaking to implement SB 1383. Since AB 1826 does not specify um, to CalRecycle what data or time period we must use to make the determination, staff considered three options regarding this process. They all revolved around the timing of waste characterization study data, as well as recycling and uh, disposal reporting system data. So staff's plan is to use the 2018 statewide waste characterization study data with the 2019 recy recycling and disposal reporting system data. And I guess a little bit of um, the current dis uh, disposal reporting system data since it starts kind of partway in 2019. This is option one in the informational item. This would allow CalRecycle to change the threshold if warranted during the first quarter of 2020. There are a number of reasons that we selected this option, including that we felt it was the most timely of the options, and it is data that we know we will have. Then, based on the analysis of the disposal data, we'll make two decisions. If the threshold requiring businesses to recycle organic waste should drop to the two cubic yards or more of solid waste per week. In making this decision, we also need to determine if lowering this threshold will not result in significant additional reductions of organics disposal. I would like to point out that if we do make this determination in early 2020, CalRecycle will allow jurisdictions until the end of 2020 to complete the process of providing organics collection service to all regulated entities. Now I'd like to talk about the rural jurisdictions. 
Under 18, AB 1826, if statewide disposal of organic waste has not been reduced by 50% to the 2014 level, then this rule exemption terminates. Unless CalRecycle de determines that eliminating the rule exemption will not result in significant additional organic disposal reductions. So in 2020, if the relative impact by rural jurisdictions on statewide disposal is not significant, CalRecycle staff plans on extending the current AB 1826 exemption until January 1, 2025. I would like to point out that this does align with the proposed SB 1383 draft regulations. Also, the SB uh, 1383 draft regulations do not conflict with the decision-making process that we're making here regarding AB 1826. And since I have the microphone still, I would like to mention that the 2019 threshold for AB 1826 does ratchet down January 1, 2019. That is months away. And it's CalRecycle's expectation that jurisdictions are already prepared to implement that lower threshold. This is going to mean there are a significant number of businesses that now need recycling service or need to recycle their organics. We're talking fast food restaurants, schools, and other small generators that have not necessarily been participating in the program. Jurisdictions have had three years now to phase in and plan for this implementation. So what are the CalRecycle staff doing? This month, um, our local assistants and market development staff have already begun contacting a number of jurisdictions that we have concerns regarding their implementation. These jurisdictions have been asked to submit informal plans to us on how they're going to address these concerns. If we're not um, if we don't receive adequate plans, then these, some of these jurisdictions may receive what's called a 30-day letter, which begins a formal process um, with these jurisdictions. I would also like to let you know that we have identified nine jurisdictions that were um, provided the opportunity to submit informal plans, and we have not felt that their progress was um, enough, and they are receiving 30-day notices this month. These nine jurisdictions will be brought um, forward at the CalRecycle monthly meeting in January. And lastly, there were 40 jurisdictions that submitted formal plans to us. This was at the April uh, 2018 monthly meeting. Our staff are closely monitoring those jurisdictions and Howard and I will be briefed in December as to the status of their progress. Should any of those jurisdictions not be making adequate progress, then they will be referred to our jurisdiction and compliance unit. With all that said, there are a lot of jurisdictions that are working hard and they're gearing up for the 2019 threshold and we're very appreciative of their efforts. That concludes my presentation. I'd like to open up if there's any questions or comments. Howard? Thanks, Kara. And while the mic's coming up, um, I want to reiterate, this is an informational item. This is definitely our proposal for, or, or this is our plan for how we're going to implement these provisions in 1826. And as Kara uh, her final remarks indicate that we are doing everything we can to implement 1826 while we're still simultaneously gearing up for 1383. Uh, there are thresholds that we expect jurisdictions to be paying attention to. We're going to be out monitoring them. We have our at any time review process that Scott sent a letter out uh, almost two years ago now that we've been implementing and that this is all part of that process as well. So uh, thanks for, re for uh, making those remarks. I think Chuck, did you have the mic first? Yeah. Chuck Helgut, Republic Services. Um, thanks for putting this on the uh, agenda now. This is a pretty critical item for all of us looking looking forward as we're wading our way through implementing thir uh, 1826 right now and, and staring 1383 in the eyes here very shortly. Um, I, I'm expressing more questions than concerns about the structure that you've outlined because we're really going to only have one year of realistic data when you make this determination. And that makes me nervous. Um, I, and I understand why you want to move quickly because you can't implement until 2022 if you wait for the 2020 waste characterization study. And if you wait for the RD, whatever it's called, the, the new 901 stuff that we're going to be doing, for that to be fully implemented. 
um, we're going to have less, pro really re only a year's worth of, of real 901 data that's going to be entered into the system. So I'm concerned that we're not using the most accurate information to kind of rush to judgment. And I know this is a somewhat of a, a value judgment on the director's perspective. If we didn't outline in 1826 exactly the process that you need to follow to come to this decision. So given those parameters, I guess I'm just, at least at this point on the record, expressing some concerns about, about the process that you've laid out. Thanks. Thank you, I appreciate those comments. Yeah, and I think those are some of the, those are the dilemmas that we tried to weigh is um, trying to have some decent data and make a, t a decision and a, a something for Scott to make a decision on in a timely manner versus that almost two year delay. Um, and we'll have to see what the, some of the data comes out to look like. Um. Evan Edgar, California Compost Coalition. Thank you very much for putting this on agenda. Very proactive, it's needed, and um, anticipated that we need to address this sooner than later, and I was happy to see this today. Um, I support option number one for uh, issue number one. I believe that 2018 data for the characterization study will have a lot of good stuff inside of there, and the 2019 um, RDS will be important to have. But I believe that, that that should be adequate data in front of us and maybe surprising what we see in order to make that um, pull the trigger for the for the next phase. So thank you for putting the agenda and creating a process. Um, with regards to issue number two, I work with a lot of rural counties and we do need a, a rural exemption. Trying to get um, tonnages together to have a cost effective program is tough out there in the rural areas to implement 1826. So I do see um, an extension of the rural exemption to 2025. And to mention the trigger for coming up for 2019 is very important. I'm working with a lot of um, different operators out there trying to approach the fast food nation of all those tonnages. And we're actually looking at different research because of the compost industry as a whole. We are working with the contaminated food waste in the post-consumer restaurant sector to clean it up with a lot of newer technologies. What is a problematic is a compostable paper and, f and food solar paper. As a compost industry, we really don't want it out there um, in our static piles or even the windrows and how to address the, the, the compulsive paper is going to be tough. Um, anaerobic digestion can handle some of it uh, with regards to it. There's different methods to go about it, but that is going to be the focus on research in 2019 and what to do with all this compostable paper. We know that China doesn't want it. They don't even want our mixed paper, let alone our food soil paper. There's different research out there with a biodrum and different ways to break down the fiber. So we'll be doing more research and research projects in 2019. Thank you. Good morning, Nick Lapis again with Californians Against Waste. Uh, we're also supportive of option one, but keeping in mind the caveat that Chuck did raise of not necessarily having very accurate data specifically on what the reduction is in 2020 if we're using 2018 waste characterization data applied to 2019 disposal data. That said, I think you guys have a lot of very capable, sorry, uh, you guys have a lot of very capable numbers folks on staff who can do some modeling and put error bars around the projections you have coming out of 2018 and 2019. And based on those error bars, you can know if, you know, if it's close or if we're really nowhere near to the 50% and it's obvious. And maybe if it's close, you should treat that a little differently um, to make sure that it is, you know, I mean, if, if you're nowhere near the 50% and it's very obvious that there's no other data that could have come out in 2020 that would have shown differently, I think that's a different story than if you're off by a few percent. I think that, oh, sorry, Nick, didn't mean to interrupt. Right, two more comments. Um, on the rural exemption, again, sort of in a similar vein, it, the way I read the staff report, it sounds like an either or decision. Either the rural exemption completely goes away in 2020 or it doesn't and you know gets punted to 2025. I, I'm not sure you have to have such a, a, a yes or no answer. I, I don't really see the 2025 date anywhere in statute there might be an opportunity to look at what subset of rural jurisdictions uh, make sense to have exempted and which subset don't make sense. I'm thinking maybe the uh, areas that are closer to composting facilities 
the more urban areas within rural counties that might have higher route density. Um, you might consider implementing the early phases of 1826, say the eight cubic yards of organics, not necessarily the last phase of 1826. I think there are a lot of shades of gray that you could look at for the rural sector. Uh, keeping in mind that they aren't just complaining and complaining, they have very legitimate concerns. And you know there are some parts of the state where the, the root density might never justify organics collection. But I don't think we should say that about all the rural jurisdictions. And my final point is whatever you decide to do on both of these items, it'd be great if you could make that decision prior to 2020 so that the only thing you have to do in 2020 is uh, look at the trigger and say yes or no, but the jurisdictions will already know what the requirements are come January 1st, 2021 or whatever you choose. Thank you. Thank you so much for all those comments. Um, and the, the second point you raised, we'll have to look at that. I'm not sure we have as much flexibility to carve out a subset of rules, but we'll we'll take that look at that. I do appreciate the concern um, applying 2018 waste characterization study data to 2019 numbers. We have worked very closely with the policy office on developing this plan and feel confident that we'll be able to do that. I also appreciate the concerns with the new 901 system and hence why I just in looking at Zoe realized that we'll have to bridge that gap because we'll be using existing um, reporting disposal system data as we do that. So we will definitely look at that. Um, the timing though presents an issue because we really do want to have the 2019, whether it's RDRS or DRS data, we need to have that complete set of data, which we will not have until early 2020. So I'm not sure we're comfortable doing any projecting using three quarters of data in 2019, but we'll, we can take that back to the team and and take that under consideration. Okay, thanks Kara very much and thanks for those comments. Uh, definitely was worth getting this out early so we could have that feedback. Um, and we'll, we'll keep you up to speed in terms of, you know, if we tweak that or as we get closer to that date. Um, Okay, we've got three other items that I need to um, just announce. I'll try to be quick. Um, we have two, two loans. One is a recycling market development zone loan uh, to pin pack packaging in Ventura County for a million dollars. Uh, this is um, one that's gonna use food grade recycled content thermoform containers, uh, which is really good to have some, somebody who's gonna take thermoform containers. Uh, uh, and that will be, um, that's already been approved, it's just an announcement. The second is a greenhouse gas reduction loan for our planet, Earth in Los Angeles. This is the second loan to our planet. Um, it's for their PET facility in Vernon and it's gonna increase diversion and jobs further. So I wanna thank the, uh, the loan team. I see Jim and Bruce and Lori back there, I'm not sure who else is back there, uh, but thank you all for that. And then lastly, uh, to announce the awards for our used oil payment program uh, for fiscal year 1819. Uh, this is a program where we have $11 million and we use a population based formula uh, every year uh, to provide uh, payments to local governments for developing used oil uh, and used oil filter collection and recycling programs. We had 204 applications for funding this year. We're recommending that all of those, or I already have uh, approved all of those. That's a total of 511 jurisdictions because some of those are regional and um, uh, applications. So uh, I wanna thank, I saw oh, Jeff and the team and Matt um, Baljot for that. Um, so thank you guys and that's approved and on the way. So you can start dispersing funds to the early requesters and the rest of the funds will be dispersed in the spring. And that's it for Howard. Enough. Great, great. So um, I'll ask Sue to come up and as she does, um, I just wanted to join in in recognizing Tom Estes too. Um, I joined uh, the Waste Management Board as a landfill inspector a few years after Tom joined and always appreciated the pre-939 folks and all the base work that they did and made it easier for the new folks coming in and picking up the, the, uh, 
the mantle and moving it forward. Um, always appreciate that that work with the open dump survey and other things. And Tom's always been helpful and supportive of program in his capacity as uh, head of admin. So thank you, Tom. I'll add in, thanks, Tom. <laughs> You're a great guy. <laughs> All right, time for the permit. So mentioned and continuing on from last month is are the first two items, IMS, Recycling Services in the City of San Diego and El Sobranto Landfill in Riverside County. So we're still processing those, we're almost done. New to this month's agenda is the City of Watsonville Landfill in Santa Cruz County. It's a revised solid waste facilities permit and action is needed November 27th, 2018. The proposed revision will allow for an increase to the final elevation from 325 to 339 feet mean sea level in phase three and update the permit to reflect the total design capacity rather than the remaining capacity. Also new is Santa Maria Regional Landfill, Santa Barbara County revised solid waste facilities permit and action is needed December 8th, 2018. The proposed revision will allow for an increase from 362.5 to 410 feet mean sea level, an increase to the estimated closure date from 2018 to 2027, and a change in hours for the receipt of waste from 5.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sunday to Saturday to 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sunday through Saturday. And not on the agenda, but currently in house is Bay Area Tire Recycling in Alameda County. This is a major waste tire facility permit and action is needed April 8th, 2019. This is an existing tire operation with a minor waste tire facility permit. The new major permit will allow for up to 30,000 waste tires on the premises at any one time. That's all I have for you this month. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Um, should I do H1? Okay, I'll do H1, which is, I don't have anything to say on H1. Nothing new. Um, next month, I expect a, a more detailed, complete report. There's a, a lot of things that I reported on last month that are still in process and should be concluded by um, early November. Good morning. Good news, beverage container recycling program, we have no action items. The other good news is still morning and I'm going to be done before noon. <laughs> we will start with um, informational items, starting from my own branch. We're gonna focus on the convenience zones, which is the half mile radius around supermarkets. Um, we typically show the four major cities in the state, LA, San Diego, San Jose, and San Francisco. Statewide, we still have low served convenience zones. It's 36% right now compared to 38 um, last year this term. San Francisco continues to be the least served with only 8%. Um, it's not improving, but we're hoping that um, consumers are finding places where they can recycle. Um, as, as convenience zones become unserved, dealers have to provide convenience, redeem continuous in store, option A, or pay $100 a day. Um, as zones become unsaved, more dealers are opting to do so, and that's what we show in the next slide. If there happens to be a safe zone with a recycling center, the recycling center can get handling fees. Um, if you notice, we paid about 738 recyclers handling fees. The number has gone down, so is the amount that they are getting, and that's because the rate per container was reduced earlier this year. The other activity function in my shop is also beverage manufacturers and distributors. As new products are introduced in the state, we register the companies and we look at their labels, make sure that they are properly labeled. And so we've been adding more distributors and beverage manufacturers to the program. So currently we are 
currently we have about 4,200 distributors and beverage manufacturers in the program. The other side of the program is the certification of recyclers, processes, and other um, displacement programs. Um, in the last three months, we've looked at 245 of these programs that we've renewed. We've provided training to Ruby participants, 141, and as you notice, are the number of recyclers and so forth. Um, it's fairly stable at this point. We are not losing as many as we used to in times past. Are there any questions? If not, I'm going to ask Jason Pagan to come up and present on our enforcement branch activities. No, I'm trying to, there we go, sorry. <laughs> um, I would like to also acknowledge Tom Estes and thank him for his hiring of my wife back in uh, the early in the late 90s that brought me here as well, so thank you. Um, our stats for the enforcement branch have been updated online. I'm just presenting some highlights. The first is that uh, the Probationary reviews, these are um, entities that are on probation. Uh, the increase in their penalty assessments from 5,200 to 65,000, an 11,000% increase. Whoops, I never clicked halfway, sorry. Um, the denial or termination of certificates increased from five in the quarter of 2017 to 15. This quarter, 300% uh, increase. A accusation uh, against RSA was amended to over $500 million. The number of IMRs, imported material reports, this is material that's coming from out of state into California decreased significantly from 1,473 to 842, a 43% decrease. So that was very good. That means uh, hopefully less material is being sold as CRV that shouldn't be. And finally, there were some arrests by our DOJ partners in the second quarter. One was in San Bernardino County a single individual with 7,700 pounds of material, uh, nearly 10, over $10,000, charged with bringing containers to the marketplace from out of state, conspiracy and attempted grand theft. Also in San Bernardino County, six other individuals were arrested with over 47,000 pounds of material, over $70,000 in CRV value and the same charges brought against them, bringing material from out of state, uh, conspiracy and attempted grand theft. And finally, we had someone bringing material in in their mobile uh, motorhome there, and they were arrested with 907 pounds of material, and they also face uh, charges for bringing material from out of state, conspiracy and attempted grand theft. Those are our highlights for the quarter. Are there any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. At this time, I'm calling Mike Miller to present on behalf of Operations Branch. Good morning. My name is Mike Miller, and the first thing I've got to address is I've been asked from uh, the audience to give an update on the convenience study. And so what I'm going to say is that it is in management review. Over the course of um, the, this year, we've had some very interesting things. The principal researcher and professor that we have worked with for many years um, ended up getting sick in the middle of this project and passing away. 
So their team was trying to put together, we asked for some changes, those changes were made and it's in review right now. Um, so I'm just gonna give you some study. My stuff is, my work is really boring. It's just a bunch of numbers and we're going out and digging through the garbage. You can take a look at these stats on the website. This is how many containers that we survey when we go out to recycling centers and all the different programs to determine the segregated refund values per pound. Uh, this is what we determine we use to pay curbside programs and what recycling centers end up paying uh, consumers. We will be releasing new rates in January and there is a hearing upcoming very quickly uh, later this month, the 24th, in Southern California. Um, here is some of the work that we do. We have a curbside allocation methodology. We go and do site visits. Curbside programs generally go to a processor, multiple curbside programs. The law says that uh, a processor can come up with a methodology so that they don't have to stop their lines, do a sort for an individual curbside program, bail it and weigh it. They can combine it and then reallocate it back out to the different programs. We have to go out and verify that those allocations are correct. So we did 12 of those. We also have for our processing payment and processing fee calculations, we have scrap value reports that are due monthly from processors that pay recycling center scrap value. We have to go out and verify that those numbers are correct because it is kind of a little complicated deal in our statute on how they determine scrap value. Our scrap value is net of transportation cost. So it's not like if you can go to the index or the market, commodities market, and look at the scrap values. This is minus transportation costs, so we wanna make sure that they're actually doing that correctly. Uh, we had some statute passed that uh, kind of reestablished the plastic market development payment, and we needed to make some payments in the rears for the first two quarters. Both of those were made, and they are, are currently in review and will be passed through the system very quickly. Uh, it was right at two and a half million dollars each quarter. So quarter one and quarter two are on the way. Um, we did about 2,200 uh, disbursements claims. Part of my staff go through and they actually work on the claims that come from recycling centers. And so that's what, that's what happened with our invoices processed and about 20, uh, 269 million in CRV paid. The other thing that I've got to cover on this topic is the biannual report, which is number four. Um, that is also in review. We have noticed that the recycling rate is ticking down. Uh, the main cause of that is sales are continuing to go up. Returns are stagnant. One of my technical staff said they're oscillating. They're going up and down over the last few years, but they're basically stagnant. People are not returning as much as uh, in relationship to sales. There's still kind of the same tonnage going through the system. It's just more sales are happening. Uh, so that's why the recycling rate is ticking down. Most of the sales are attributed to water bottle sales. About 70% of the increases that we're seeing are half liter water bottle increases. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you, Mike. I kept my promise. Congratulations, Tom. I might follow you, so let me know how it's like in a few weeks. Okay, uh, thank you for joining. Oh. Yeah, we have a question. Go ahead, Ralph. Good morning, Ralph Simone. Well, no, it's not. Yes, it is. Uh, good morning, Ralph Simone, representing the PRCC Plastic Recycling Corporation of California. Uh, Mike, thank you for mentioning the UC study and the fact that it's still pending. A lot of us have been looking forward to that for quite a while. Uh, the question is somewhat generic. And there, the last report, I believe, was six weeks ago or so, quarterly report. Uh, George, can you comment on what you estimate to be the current surplus in the beverage container recycling fund? Mike? <laughs> Okay, so we'll get back to Ralph with surplus numbers. Anything else? Okay, thank you for attending the monthly public workshop.